newspapers lived off of for centuries is really, it's not there anymore. The Facebook membership accelerator has allowed us to focus on the value that we're providing to our readers. I believe that there's an opportunity here to tell the story of whatever city that you're in, whatever county that you're in, and make a difference in that community through storytelling. Today, the journalism industry faces many challenges. So we're introducing the Google News Initiative, our effort to enable journalism to thrive in a digital age. It will enable new models for sustainable journalism, elevate quality journalism, and ensure that technology allows journalists to do their jobs even better. Because when journalism succeeds, we all do. It's not on. Okay, there you go. I, I had suggested to Chris that he provide us with good alcohol for the six o'clock sessions, because frankly, I think that this conversation probably ought to be done in, in a bar uh, with alcohol, but we can continue this conversation afterwards uh, in a bar with alcohol. But um, thank you very much for those of you who um, have come here in person uh, to join this discussion. Um, so... The genesis of, of, of this panel really came uh, last December when I was in Berlin and I had the pleasure of meeting Zuza uh, and, we, and she asked a question that hit home very hard to me. She said, is it possible for news to be unbiased? And she was asking this of, of a group that included me who has worked for Reuters for the best part of 20 years. Um, where we, when we arrive at Reuters, it is kind of slammed into us that we will report with speed, accuracy, and freedom from bias. You might know that Reuters is governed by five trust principles, uh, the second of which says that we will act uh, consistently with integrity, independence, and freedom from bias. I mean, it's literally written into our constitution. So when Zuza asked the question, I was a little perturbed because I suddenly thought I've lived all this time thinking that we're an unbiased news agency and I've actually now got to start thinking that we try to, to be as unbiased as possible but naturally as human beings we have bias. And so a few of the, the points that, that we discussed then was the bias of story choice, the, sto the bias of facts, the bias of tone um, and Luckily, she didn't leave me in my mess of worrying about things because we actually came up with A, some hacks, and B, some ideas around um, how just to be honest about our biases and why actually bias might not be such a bad thing, even though we tend to get criticized for bias in the media all the time. So I wanted to bring this discussion to Perugia, where we have so many bright and engaged people who, who love journalism and who want to make it a better place. Um, and who are engaged in, in its future. So what we're going to do in this panel is that I'm going to ask Zuza to uh, introduce this topic by sharing some of her findings that she has done uh, in, in the part of her life where she is teaching mindfulness and looking at the psychological um, areas around our biases. And then we're going to go through the panel um, to, to explain kind of where we stand on, on the spectrum uh, of of neutral to not neutral news. Uh, and then we really do want to open it up for questions uh, and for a debate with the room. So hopefully we'll leave a good 25 minutes for that. We also want to make it a positive experience, so we are gonna share some hacks that we've come up with as to how to, you can unbias your own 
uh, news production and maybe even also your news consumption. So with that, I'm going to hand across to Zusa to sort of set the scene for us. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really excited to be able to speak to you about this topic uh, because I stumbled upon it not really having planned on bringing um, neuroscience into my uh, journalism work. However, as a mindfulness teacher, there is a big portion of um, the programs I run that pertain to perception, how the brain perceives information. And the more I dug into this to understand it, the more relevant it began to appear to the work that we're all doing. What I discovered is that at any moment, in any second, our bodies are actually, through our senses, processing 11 million bits of information. 11 million. The majority of that information that comes in through our senses is being stored in an unconscious part of our brain, this black box, that doesn't have a lot of connection to what we can actually work with consciously. The conscious bit of our brain, the operational memory, can only house seven plus minus two objects at any one time. So to go from 11 million to seven plus minus two is a really amazing process of selection that our brain does in two very distinct ways. Way number one, intentional attention. If I ask everyone in this room to focus on this bottle, to take a look at it, to remember the details, most of you, when you leave this meeting, will remember the bottle. However, if when we come up to you in this bar that Jane has invited us to, <laughs> and we ask you what else you remember, I guarantee you that every single one of you will leave this room with a different memory of what transpired. Not because you're bad people, not because you're trying to manipulate information, not because you're slanted by nature, but because we have limited bandwidth as human beings, and we are only capable of taking away a limited number of facts. Now, what does that mean about journalism? The exact same thing, meaning it de the story we get really depends on who's telling it. So these unconscious, so the second way that our brain filters from the 11 million to the seven plus minus two is through algorithms, unconscious algorithms that are collectively known as biases. There are 183 general cognitive biases that all of our minds have and use. These are things like negativity bias, which means that negative information impacts us three times as powerfully as positive information. In relationships, it's actually five to one. <laughs> um, other biases include confirmation bias. We look for confirmation of things we already believe. Is this sound, starting to sound scary? There's in-group bias, meaning that we tend to like and believe and trust people who are like us. This speaks to um, work that I'm doing in News Mavens, which is a new newsroom comprised entirely of women who tend to not make the in-group bias cut when it comes to leadership in the news. Other biases include, and this one is fun, there's the bizarreness bias which means that we have a tendency to remember the weird stuff. Um, there's, um, like there was a cover of a tabloid um, that had man gets hit on the head with flying dildo. And these are the kinds of stories that tabloids like to lead with because you're far more likely to remember them and mention them at the dinner table than how the stock market did or how unemployment is doing. So, uh, a lot the, out of the 183 biases, I'm going to mention just one more, and that is we all have a tendency to be able to identify other people's biases, but not our own. Um, that being said, what neurologists have concluded is that human beings have very little contact with objective reality. We actually have contact with our very own interpretations of what's happening around us. And I think I'm going to leave you with that 
uh, as a description of what we're all equipped with, and in summary, just say that biases are not something that bad people do who have ill intentions. It's how our minds work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susa. Um, so with that framing, um, I'd like to introduce uh, the panel and get them to, to share with us um, a little bit, A, about what they do, uh, what the, their companies do, and, uh, and, and their take on bias and, and how to work with it or how to work against it. So first of all, to my left is Rachel Smolkin, uh, who runs CNN Politics. Uh, she's a busy woman uh, sitting in Washington, D.C., uh, covering all things political uh, on the digital side of CNN. So Rachel, CNN's come under plenty of criticism from the, from the president down of being biased, um, but you have been doing a lot of work in the newsroom uh, to, to counter that. Can you mm -hmm. t tell us a little bit about what you're up to? Sure. Sure. Well, uh, thank you all so much for having me today. It's really great. This is my first time in Perugia, so really great to be a part of this. Uh, as Jane said, I run uh, the digital team in Washington. I came to CNN uh, shortly before the 2014 midterm elections with the goal of building a digital team in the Washington Bureau and transforming the way we covered Washington and politics in digital. Uh, so I had this opportunity to build the team alongside this unprecedented presidential campaign and now this uh, very busy time in Washington uh, as we cover the Trump administration and gear up for the next presidential campaign all at the same time. Uh, CNN strives to be, uh, to be unbiased in our coverage, to be down the middle. That's, that's very distinct from the other cable networks that are coming from a particular political perspective. We don't at CNN, and my work is in the digital area, but that holds true across the network. But saying that we don't cover something with bias does not mean that we simply regurgitate each side and leave it at that. It does not mean false equivalency. It does not mean if somebody makes a statement, we just quote them and move on. We use context in our work, we use explanation in our work, uh, we call out statements that are not correct, that are, if there, something is false, we say that's false very directly. So that's, a, being unbiased in our work, it's more complicated than just, we have a story, look, we quoted one side and we quoted the other side. We have to make sure that we're bringing the proper context to it, that we're being fair, but also that we're not afraid to call something out as wrong when it's wrong, no matter uh, who says it or what party they represent. So I think that's a really important component of our work. I've really stepped up our fact-checking work that we're doing at CNN now. We're really uh, emphasizing through our Facts First marketing campaign and our Facts First fact checking that we are a facts led news organization and that's where our focus is. And the third piece I give to that is to say, I think it's so important to have diversity in a newsroom because that's ultimately uh, a great check to make sure that we're bringing per different perspectives to our work. So I think having people from different races, different genders, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic classes, different geographic locations, all of those are ways to uh, ensure that the different perspectives are coming into our work and we're not unconsciously bringing bias to our work because everybody is the same, which does creep in and having a diverse staff has many, many benefits and I would say that is one of them. Question for you, Rachel. Um, you know, the, the, from President Trump down, people will say, yeah, okay, but you're still biased because you're still criticizing X, Y, or Z on, 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 on this, or you're choosing to, to fact check this person or that person. Um, and we, we tend to get uh, a lot of criticism that most of the media are liberal bias. Do you also try and hire people of different political persuasions in, in the newsroom? 
So uh, I work in the newsroom, not in the opinion section. I don't ask my reporters what their political beliefs are. I make sure I do not see that emerging in their work, whether that's uh, on their social media feeds or in their news stories that they're writing. I do, though, try to bring people in from a variety of backgrounds. So we have people who we've hired from the Washington Post, from Politico, and more conservative news organizations like the Weekly Standard. Actually, our primary fact checker comes from the Weekly Standard, and that's uh, traditionally seen as a more conservative uh, news organization. So I do think that having people with a mixture of experiences and news organizations that they've grown up with and worked for in the past is important in a newsroom. Thank you. Um, Michael, you founded um, a blog in the UK which is very pro-Brexit, very openly so. Um, you've got your fair share of brickbats as well, of people saying that you are opinionated and biased and everything, and you say yes. Absolutely, so, <laughs> to, yeah. to explain a little bit about you know, how Westminster came about and a little bit about your, your take on this, this subject. Do you want me to talk about bias as well or after? Yeah, yeah, no, okay, do, sure. do, do both. Yeah, so I mean, Westminster really is it's a site set up a couple of years ago. It's one of the new generation, I think you're going to see a lot more of them, of uh, niche... Um, news websites with clear editorial um, values. And it makes no bones about it. It comes from a very clear position. And we're pro-Brexit as one example of that. Now, interestingly, in the, I can only speak of the UK, but in the UK we've got a very interesting system where we've got Ofcom, who are basically the regulatory uh, body for broadcast media. Now, what happens in the UK, unlike in the US and others, is that all of the broadcast media is meant to be balanced and impartial. But what I think the big change we're seeing now in the UK and why you're seeing more accusations of mainstream media bias is because of the internet. It's changed so many things. I think the difference now is when you see uh, presenters on television um, claiming to be unbiased and then you go on their news feeds or their Twitter feeds. For instance, if you look at something like Channel 4 News, if you look at the likes of Jon Snow, Matt Fry, you can clearly see if you go through their online footprint uh, a clear interest in anti-Brexit stories as an example whether it's hyping up petitions uh, to stop Brexit and, and, and other things like that. Yet, on the other side, they never put out stories that in any way favour Brexit. So I think now journalists have to think very, very carefully about this. If you're, care if you're constantly putting out your personal opinion online and putting out stories of one slant and then going on TV and telling the audience that you have to trust me as a neutral uh, presenter of both sides, I think there's a major credibility gap there. Are you a political commentator? Or are you a correspondent? I think that's something that people have to increasingly think about. Um, I think in the UK, and especially perhaps in the UK, we've got a problem of a very London-centric media. And what I mean by that is uh, most or nearly all of the major media organisations are based in London. That's where all the programmes happen. It's where a lot of the journalists themselves live. And the problem with that is that if you look at... I mean, YouGov released a poll the other day on no-deal Brexit versus Remain. And what it showed is that in Wales and across virtually the whole of England, no deal Brexit leads remain, apart from in London, where there's a huge lead for remain. There is no doubt that London politically is uh, very different from most of the rest of the country. And so when you have a media power base that's based in one geographic location largely, I think that reflects some of the coverage. And that's why it leads to a disconnect, I think, um, the accusations. I mean, even Question Time this week, which is sort of the, the primetime BBC show uh, in the UK. Actually, they were supposed to have a, a show in Bolton this week, uh, which is a pro-leave area, and actually moved it to London and said, well, because we wanted to make sure our guests could make it. Now, you can imagine how that looks to people that don't live outside of London, that you've constantly got this media moving around and this power base that they feel is very out of touch with the rest of the country. I'd also just point as well, you talk about diversity, I agree. I think, for me, though, the most important diversity is the socioeconomic background. It's having people from across the country from different backgrounds. And what's really interesting, 2017, the Social Mobility Commission in the UK did an uh, update. And what they said is that in the UK now, or in 2017, 51% of journalists are privately educated. In 1986, it was 49%. So the proportion of journalists in the UK, according to the Social Mobility Commission, that are privately educated from rel relatively affluent backgrounds has actually gone up, not down. So in many ways, diversity in the UK there has gone backwards. Um, 
And I'll just point out as well, I mean, Sky Data did a poll recent February 2019, if we focus specifically on Brexit, and they said to people, um, after the issue of Brexit, do you uh, trust the mainstream media more or less? 6% said more, 58% said less. I would argue the mainstream media coverage of Brexit has been appallingly one-sided at some times, and it's damaged the credibility overall of what's going on. If you look as well at uh, Pew Research Centre in May 2018, they actually, and this is, this is interesting because it puts a deferential from the UK and other countries across Europe, they said to people, um, do you trust the mainstream media somewhat or a lot? The Netherlands, 67% of people said somewhat or a lot. You go to the UK, it's down to 32%. And guess what's the, uh, the bottom of the pile? Italy, funnily enough. Only 29% of the people in Italy, according to Pew Research Centre, um, uh, trust mainstream media. So even you know, within Europe, UK, there's a huge discrepancy there of in some countries, the Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, it being around two-thirds of people trusting the media. And then when you get to the UK and Italy, it's less than one-third. I think that's quite an interesting, uh, you know, because you've obviously got different regulations and different uh, media setups. So <laughs> overall, I think, um, I, I'm just finishing, the BBC recently, this week actually, over a different issue, um, emailed their staff and said that BBC News staff are now going to have to be more careful about the, what they tweet out on their Twitter accounts. And I actually think if the mainstream media wants to stop the erosion of trust, that's something they're going to have to look a lot more at. I do not think it's a sustainable model to have journalists consistently putting out private opinions and then going on television or writing pieces and saying, trust me, I'll give you the full facts. I think it insults the audience. I don't think it's got um, a long-term future. I think what you're going to be looking at a lot more is a much more fragmented media landscape where you have people, you know that where the bias is coming from, or you know where the slant is, you know their editorial direction. And I think as long as people get a plurality of views and aren't just encouraged to live within an echo chamber, I don't see anything wrong with that. And tell me, over the last couple of years since you started up, how have you seen your audience grow and how have you seen the engagement um, with both the, the politicians in the UK and then also other media in the UK change over the last couple of years? Has, has it, have you become more mainstream <laughs> and being brought in from the fringes or are people well, trying to just keep you out there on the fringe? I think it's interesting because you've got to, I mean, obviously, one of the challenges we have and other similar models will have is that you'll get the accusation that you're not credible or that the information you're putting out is not correct. Um, no one's been able to live with that at, at us. It's factual information with an editorial slant. But what you're seeing is that the organisations that manage to do this and start and build credibility, for instance, get invited on to BBC News and Sky News, which I do. So it shows that it isn't an either or. If you start an alternative uh, news outlet, it isn't a case of you have, you're sort of some underground renegade. You obviously have that niche audience, but you can actually link in and be part of the mainstream media conversation as well. So I think that's something you're going to increasingly see, people starting their own companies um, you know, with a small staff and a small budget and building it up and actually becoming much more, uh, you know, bigger voices. And you're seeing that both on the left and the right now in the UK. So it'll be interesting to see if that spreads throughout Europe as well. Brilliant, thanks. Right. Susa, you, um, with your News Mavens hat on, have been uh, very transparent about your biases. Will you explain a little bit about what you've been doing over the last, again, couple of years and some of the learnings that you found from having the, the lens that you have put very firmly on the news? Sure. Um, I agree with um, Michael that actually bias can be an opportunity. It certainly has been for news mavens because the people who don't feel that their views or their values are represented in mainstream media are looking for a media outlet that matches their bias. It's actually not the promise of objectivity that is creating audiences now, in my view is actually looking for organizations that see the world in a similar way as I do. And the way News Maven sees the world is that women are underrepresented in newsroom leadership. And what we set out to prove was that it was actually a question, more of an experiment. What will happen if only women choose the news? It was a question about whether the neglected viewpoint, perspective of women, actually would bring something different and valuable into the news narrative. And so we very um, purposely created a bias. We are very upfront about it, like, um, like Westminster, we are 
very clear about our liberal values, we're pro a united Europe, we cover all of Europe, including the parts of Europe that nobody ever hears about in English. Um, this is one of the biases that mainstream media has that we identified, meaning if you search for news about Europe in these global sections or even the European section, what you will find is news about Brexit and Angela Merkel and um, France and whatever country has dealing with a terrorist attack or an economic crisis. Everyone else is just this amorphous kind of background European blob. Meanwhile, there are very real people with real discoveries, interesting learnings, problems, and knowledge and skills that they are not sharing because they're not being reported on. So our bias is um, pro-European, which means everybody. And we report on Slovakia, we report on Italy, we report on Greece, we report on Serbia. Gosh, are there things happening in Serbia? Uh, we report on Estonia and all these other places. And what we've discovered is that, okay, there's a reason why mainstream media is not writing about these countries. Nobody cares. These stories from these places are not being read, except for by the people who live in them. This has been a very interesting discovery of mine, meaning that when you write about countries that are used to being ignored in English, and you serve up that content into the media conversation, the narrative around current affairs in Europe, people become very self-conscious. If you're not used to being looked at, suddenly having your business talked about in English really matters to you. And this has been an important discovery because that means this is, that this is a way to draw Italians' attention to Italian issues in a more powerful way just by writing about them in English. And when we look at our stories from these underreported parts of Europe, that's a lot of what we're discovering, is that people read about their own countries more. Um, other discoveries is that um, when women were choosing news about the economy, uh, politics, um, education, it wasn't getting a lot of readership attention. Because there's one thing about what we were trying to do as a team. We have 30 women from all over the, uh, the continent. It's another thing what readers actually wanted to read about. And what we discovered and what we ended up pivoting to is that women want to read about women's issues because we feel that there are not enough of them. And do you know what the single most read topic on News Mavens pertains to? It's rape. The stories about rape have the largest audience. And I've been thinking about this nonstop for three weeks. Why the hell is that? And I have a theory, can I share it? Mm -hmm. My theory is that we don't believe the statistics. And we know that there are many women who are afraid to come forward who don't report their sexual assaults. And we know there are countries where coming forward is much more difficult. And in those places where we don't believe the statistics, reading real stories is the only thing we can believe. These are the smoke signals that women pay attention to. So I could go on about learnings, but those are some of, the, mm. some of the most recent ones that I've been thinking about. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'd just love to um, get a few ideas from the people up, up here, just to start with, in terms of um, maybe some of, the, some of the tips that, we have, that we've thought about um, around how to spot bias. Um, I think, you know, for those of us who sit firmly uh, in the neutral zone um, of, of the bias um, spectrum, you know, we, we have to keep checking our biases. As, as Zuzu was saying, like, there are 183 different biases, and we are human, and it's a natural part of human life, and yet we're trying to serve a, a hugely plural, global um, audience with news. So how can, we, how can we kind of hack those biases? And over lunch, I was, I was telling the guys here that... Um, that there was an editor when I first started at Reuters who, who would say, if you can catch an adjective, kill it. And, 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 and his, his essential hack was to look for any adjective, any adverb um, that was there in your copy because the chances were that it would imply some sort of judgment on, on the story and, and on what you as a human being, you as the reporter, you as the writer, um, had thought about. We, we have the same thing in, in video. We'll often 
you know, make sure that, that people uh, who aren't sort of, you know, professional video journalists but who are taking videos uh, get a really big variety of shots so that we can actually see sort of, from the very wide shot down to the close-up kind of what was the context in which this was shot so that we can tell that story more broadly. Um, but I wonder if, Rachel, you want to share and, and, and others kind of some of the ways that you're looking at, at hacking things. I used to work for Scripps Howard News Service and I had an editor who would take out all the adjectives in stories, <laughs> actually, which I worry about what happens to the storytelling in that scenario, but I, I was trained in a, a similar way. Uh, I think that we have to think about our journalism in stages because the story itself is only one stage. The, the first stage is story selection. So I think that we really have to check our biases in what stories we are choosing every day to do or to not do and look at that against um, our competitive set, against our audience interest, against the feedback we're getting, and think about whether we're doing stories that might take us in one direction more than another direction. Uh, is that a matter of bias? Is it a matter of neglecting certain viewpoints out there? Are there areas of coverage that might speak to certain audiences that we're neglecting? Uh, just to give you one example, I recently started a column called The Home Front, and it's a look at the gap between military families and civilians and trying to bridge that gap by just explaining more about what military families are going through. And this is an area we just weren't writing a lot about except when there was a military story or we're writing about a war, a conflict, a war zone. Uh, and one of our anchors, Brianna Keeler, is a military wife herself and brings a lot of passion to this issue. So she came to me and said she really wanted to do more, she really wanted to communicate with audiences around this. And we've started the column and I'm, I'm really proud of it. She does a beautiful job uh, bringing in the viewpoints of others but also sharing a little bit of her own experiences as a, a military wife and mother. So those are audiences that we would not be reaching otherwise. So there's the story selection phase, then you get to the story itself, and we have to constantly gut check the story. Have I represented multiple perspectives? If the story is framed a certain way, are we including pushback against the frame or the viewpoint that shows it, it might not be true? What, what I grew up hearing was called the to be sure graph and I usually take those to be sure words out. But the to be sure graph where you acknowledge the caveats and the limitations of the thesis and the other viewpoint. So that's the story itself and the constant gut checking about both what is there in the story and what isn't there that should be there in your story. Then there's the distribution of the story. How are we framing the story when we put it on Twitter, when we put it on Facebook, when we put it on Instagram, when we programming it, programming it on the homepage and desktop and the apps and mobile and what happens and does bias creep in when we take our desktop head and shorten it so it looks nice on our phones. So those are all the places for the distribution that we have to continue to self-check against any, anything that might look like a bias, even if it's not intended that way, even if the intent was only to make your headline fit in a smaller space, how can that sometimes come across as bias? So that's the distribution phase. And then there's the phase of if there's an issue with the story, if you find a, a problem in the story that needs to be addressed, transparency I think becomes incredibly important with audiences. Are we transparent in correcting when we make a mistake to say what we got wrong and how we fixed it, if we've clarified, if we've updated a story with a comment from somebody's attorney or a politician that wasn't in there in the original version because they couldn't be reached for comment, do we say at the bottom, updated to include comment? So I would consider those the four phases mm -hmm. of a story where we really have to check against bias for each of those phases. It's interesting because I mean, quite a lot of that is, is pure editing, right? Yeah. It's like kind of what we've been taught to do Trying from, to do. Yeah from sort of the first moment that we, that we entered into journalism. But I'm, I'm really interested by, by, by your idea about what, what life is somebody living outside of the office mm -hmm. that, that they can actually bring in to the newsroom and to the story selection. 
Um, I often find that, um, that even though you know, we, we talk about working holistically and bringing your whole self and you know, making sure that we're looking after the whole person and everything, we do tend to go into kind of work mode. And, and, and I often think, you know, when, when I sit with colleagues having a drink, are we going to be talking about the same stories as we actually were writing today? I mean, at the moment in the UK, yes, because everyone's obsessed with Brexit. But, you know, actually everyone brings in so many other things, and, and maybe we do need to, to open our eyes more to, to that diversity of experience outside. Um, Michael, you were chatting a bit earlier about sort of like following the social conversation and, and how you're, you're monitoring that as well. It's probably not going to hack a bias of yours because you're going to stay firmly where you are. Sure. But, but how, how, do you, how do you kind of get a sense of what that conversation is and use that? Well, of course, I mean, you know, social media is obviously a game changer again. And um, I think something that's very interesting that people look at more and more now is the, what's appearing in the headlines at the, the 6 o'clock news isn't always what people are talking about. In fact, a lot of the time it isn't. There's a lot of um, social media analytics going on now. Um, and what you can see sometimes, I think there was a story around the time of the general election to do with, I can't remember what it was exactly, it was something to do with pets or dogs. And obviously, in the UK, we, we love our dogs, we love our pets. It, was, it went viral. And yet, it wasn't considered to be an important news story in terms of the mainstream media coverage. So things like that, and trends that are going much talked about, but aren't necessarily leading the narrative, I think that needs to become a key consideration. And in terms of um, just the point before about um, bias and, and, and looking for it, um, I think media framing is the term I would use. You know, I've seen, especially things like opinion polls, where there's quite a few questions in there. I mean, I've seen opinion polls done with about, sliced about five or six different ways, depending on what that journalist, what that outlet felt was the most important question, or in some cases, of course, what backs up their editorial um, argument the most. And I, you know, I would encourage people to definitely go and look at the source material, what I try and do is I always link the polling directly. If I'm referencing numbers, I will provide the link for people to go and click and see the full thing. I don't want to be pulling out individual numbers and not allowing people to go and look at the, the, you know, the, the, the work in its entirety. And I also think what you're, going to, what you're starting to see more and more, and I'm doing it some of it myself, is you're actually seeing people, viewers at home, if they think the mainstream media have got something wrong or they've left something out, and again, media framing is the term I would use, it's not necessarily outright lies, it's just bits of information that have been omitted. And the classic example for me, I'll go back to Channel 4 News again, they did a six-minute report um, the other month about Brits living in Spain and what will happen after a no-deal Brexit. And the narrative was there's great uncertainty, no one knows what's going to happen. They didn't mention the fact that, in, I think it was in December, the Prime Minister of Spain had actually said that no matter what happens, whatever scenario, Brits will be protected. And actually a royal decree since then has come out offering citizenship to around 400,000. Now that to me was a classic example of a report that completely left out a key piece of information. And when challenged, they didn't even defend it. And I think that increasingly, you, you're not going to be able to get away with that. If you see bits of information left out that they think are relevant, they are entitled to ask why it wasn't put in. And simply to putting your head in the sand and saying, well, because well, we didn't want to, doesn't really wash. I think mm. people have to start engaging a lot more with the audience in that way when they're critical. Zizo, you've done a lot of work on this, uh, about hacking our biases. Maybe share with, with the room, before we go to questions, some of, some of the things that you've come up with. I have a, a, num a collection. I have this, um, some people collect stamps. Uh, I collect bias <laughs> hacks. I have, um, I have two that I uh, wanted to share that um, refer to some of the things that uh, my predecessors have talked about. One, I want to build on complexity. Because the thing about the way our brains work is they are these amazing storytelling machines. And they have this capacity to take random bits of information and connect them into tidy stories. Okay, our brains do this. For example, when you're worried about something and suddenly you see signs, like the fact that the light changed green and your favorite car just drove by and you smell your favorite croissant, you think, ah, it's a sign, things are gonna go well. You know, our brains do this all the time. <laughs> and there's, a, there's a, um, a researcher who I've read a lot um, who deals with how the brain works. His name is David Ka uh, Daniel Kahneman. He's um, uh, a, an award-winning economist and, um, and neurologist, and, what, and psychologist, I'm sorry. And what he says, he gives, he gives some advice. 
he wrote this great book called Thinking Fast and Slow, and I think every journalist should read it. Because the thing that happens when we're, when we're reacting quickly, like the knee-jerk reaction, the, the thing we do instinctively, um, that's the fast thinking, and that's when we make use of these unconscious biases. That's when we harness that power. Now, when we take a step back and we intentionally think about something again, now this is harder. This actually burns more glucose, and lazy brains don't like to burn glucose. We prefer the fast thinking. But if you take a step back and you think again, and you ask yourself the difficult questions, and you look at the complexity of the story, as opposed to the one you're most inclined to write, that's when you start managing your biases. Because we can't eradicate bias entirely. It's too hardwired into our system. But we can begin to manage our bias. And what kind of man, he has this great bit of advice for journalists. He says, avoid predicting rare events with hard conviction. OK, so when you're looking at a story and you think, and you've got the worst case scenario in mind, and as a political commentator, you feel like <laughs> busting out a story about that, that's the moment when you take a step back and you think again. Because this capacity to make neat stories is a dangerous one. Another, um, and the second thing I wanted to mention is intention, which is building on what uh, Rachel was talking about. The thing about journalism is that the way it's been taught that I think gets lost sometimes um, is curiosity. So there's, when you check your intention when you're going to write a story, um, ask yourself whether you're going out to confirm something you believe in firmly and you want to convince your readers to believe it with you, or whether you're going out to discover what the truth is. That is a very key intention. And there's a gentleman named Paul Taylor, who used to be a, co a political commentator for the Washington Post, who had this method of checking himself, whether he's, he was writing to confirm or writing to discover. And he called it the before and after lead. And what he would do is he would, before he went to research the story, before he began writing, he would write the lead. Then he'd put it away. Then he'd do the work write the story, and then before he filed it, he would compare his original, his first lead, with the one that came after. And if they are too similar, that means he set out to confirm his bias, rather than to discover things he didn't know before. Thank you so much. Um, so there you go, a, a few little ideas about, about bias, maybe how to hack it. Um, I'd like to uh, open things up to the room. I'm sure there are plenty of um, questions. We've got a roving mic which is useful for those people who are listening on YouTube. Um, so can we get one, two, and three um, to start with? Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Linda Thompson. I'm a Belgian freelance journalist. I just wanted to know um, what is the reward in CNN policy when it comes to particularly freelance journalists tweeting um, opinions? Because I thought that was a really interesting um, yeah, thing that I struggle with myself. So. How, does, how do CNN and Reuters handle that, particularly for freelance journalists? Well, journalists uh, in the news division do not tweet their opinions, and CNN is quite strict about that. It, it's part of our social media guidelines. Uh, I would vet a freelancer's work if I were going to use a freelancer to make sure that wasn't present, if I were going to hire someone for political coverage. Now, of course, CNN also has contributors, and they are on our air or on our op-ed pages giving a particular viewpoint. So they're labeled uh, on our digital site as, as opinion. Uh, and that's not the same as somebody who's a reporter writing a straight news story. So that's a little bit different. But certainly in the, the news division, uh, we take that very seriously about somebody tweeting personal opinions, particularly on a subject they're covering, but really on any subject, I wouldn't want to see my reporters tweeting uh, opinions. They, they might sometimes write about what kind of 
whether they like Kentucky Fried Chicken more than another kind of fried chicken, but it shouldn't get um, any more policy oriented. Depends if they, than does that. It depends I, if I they do cover young brands or not. Really. Likes <laughs> to tweet about Kentucky Fried Chicken, so that's a that's an actual example. <laughs> um, I think too. I I was just thinking during our previous conversation about bias, and we tend right now, I think, often to think about it in terms of. Uh, partisanship and ideological biases, but it's also important uh, along the prediction lines to gut check ourselves against uh, assumptions that we're making about the political establishment and what, uh, what are predictors and how certain things will play out and uh, anyone who needed a, a gut check against that has only to look at the 2016 presidential election. So I just, I've been thinking during our conversation that there are many forms of, of bias and we have to guard against them all. Can I just comment on of course. That? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And something I think, you know, the internet, particularly if you're some relatively young grown up in society now, the big problem that you've got is the internet has got a hell of a long memory, right? <laughs> and so the question a lot of journalists can have to start asking themselves is, you know, if I'm coming out as an avowed socialist or conservative and I'm spouting lots of opinions all over the place, and then in five years' time, I want, to be ta I want to be taken seriously as a neutral observer that's following one of the campaigns. That could cause big problems, because the accusation is going to be, well, no, you're just basically a, a, an enemy of that side or you're friendly, too friendly with that side. And so I think those that are going into journalism at times are going to have to take a longer-term view of what is it exactly I want to do and be mindful of that, because I think to have credibility... I mean, I'm not looking to be a straight-down-the-line neutral reporter. So I can give my opinion. But if people want to be constantly giving out personal political opinions and their personal political beliefs, I then think there's a credibility gap if you're saying, trust me to be completely down the line in a couple of years. So I certainly, and this applies to a lot of other aspects of social life and everything, but certainly with careers and with politics, I think people need to start taking a longer term view as to what they want their, their, their footprint on the internet to be. Hmm. Can I get, um, actually, let, let's get a couple of questions in, in the can, because... So if we take the, the lady in the, in the blue top there in the middle, had her hand up, and then the lady in the light blue top at the back, they were the next two. If we can get those two, and then we'll... Hello, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Alicia from Taiwan, and I'm also a freelance journalist. It's really interesting to talk about bias and anti-bias in these panels. Uh, I found it quite interesting that bias itself is really is, is a natural, is really natural. Uh, everybody has bias. It's more important to be aware of bias and, and how to manage a bias. But I find it quite interesting that we talk about today, it's about like how journalists to be aware of bias, but not really talk about how readers mm -hmm. to like uh, be aware of that. And that's so important. And that's really dangerous if the readers can't catch like what you try to do. So um, what I want to ask is about how, like as a media outlet or as a journalist, how to help readers to be aware of the biases, as what you mentioned, like the selection and distribution, how to discourse yourself to let readers know your biases. Thank you. Thank you. If you can pass the microphone to the back there, the lady in the light blue shirt. We'll just get a couple of questions and then we can deal with them together. Okay, hi, my name's Laura. I'm a freelance journalist from the UK. Um, I have a sort of a twofold question. So first of all, last week I went to a Brexit conference and the BBC um, was being criticised for being too on the fence, too um, neutral um, when covering Brexit. Um, so I just wondered what, what you had to say to that. Uh, and the second question is, is bias ever good? Um, and, you know, should we as journalists use bias sometimes to pr perhaps promote good? Excellent. Very good questions. Um, anyone have a view on the first question about helping readers with their biases? I have a tip from Kahneman again. He says one of the dangers that we as journalists face is that we tend to lean into audience bias because our readers expect certain... Um, perspectives from us and if we suddenly turn on a dime and start representing a different world view they will be disappointed but he says it's a very important to try to expand our readers um, world view to try to introduce information that doesn't necessarily conform to what they're expecting and he recommends using the word surprisingly <laughs> 
It's one that you guys would strike in your editorial process. <laughs> it would be. <laughs> um, but Sometimes. If, <clears throat> it would depend. Some, but if you're reporting on a, on a politician that you're critical of, but you have in your possession facts about, that are positive about him or her, instead of omitting them, use them, using, add them using the word surprisingly, he or she also, X, Y, and Z, which is a way of keeping readers feeling safe and at home and taken care of, but also widening their tolerance for complexity. I'd go back to transparency again. I think transparency is so important, particularly right now when we're in a moment where uh, public trust in media has, uh, has waned. And I think labeling is very important. We label opinion, we label analysis, and we bust you. We generally start the day with a news analysis that we're leading our site with, and that's labeled analysis because it's not a straight news story. There's a little bit of, of uh, perspective that's added, a little voicier than we might have our straight news story. So I think there's a lot more work we can do in that area because Jane and I were chatting before about how much do audiences really <coughs> see that? Do they really understand the difference between analysis and opinion? Is there more we should do to convey that and help with that? But I think that's the right space for the discussion to be happening in. Yeah, I'll just say as well, I mean, I think, I think what annoys the audience is when they're insulted when there's a, um, a brand is pretending to be neutral, and it clearly isn't. And I think actually, the, as long as the, the language is clear, and, you know, if you read The Guardian, it's clear they're not going to endorse the, endorse the Conservatives. If you read The Telegraph, they're not going to back, uh, you know, the Lib Dems or the Greens or whatever. I think you have to give the audience some credit. I think they are able to, especially nowadays, if they're on Twitter and things like that, and they've got a stream of media companies, they could be following 30, 40. I think they are able largely to differentiate um, the editorial positions based on the tone and the conversations that are taking place. But as I said, I think the backlash comes when um, some news organisations sort of purport to be straight down the middle. And of course, there's a judgment call from the audience whether they are being so or not. And just coming on to the, the, the second point, just on the second point of the second point, um, in terms of if it's ever good, I actually think it is. Because I think if, you're, um, if people have a natural passion or interest in a certain part of public policy, or a certain country, or a certain politician, or whatever it is, that passion and interest actually is gonna cause them to dig a lot deeper on the subject and particularly with what I do, um, you know, I look at what my audience is interested in. Fascinating to see the amount of interest there are in European elections. So when there's a Dutch election, um, pro-Brexit audience is fascinated to know how are the Eurosceptic parties doing, how are the pro-EU parties doing, and that's not, you know, we've had that time and time again with the European elections. Um, in Italy, when we report on what's going on with the sort of five-star movement and Liga and things like that, again, a huge reaction. And just one other thing to put onto that, the advancing technology is astounding now that you can use Google Chrome or whatever, and you can go on an Italian news website and they click at a button and it translates it. Now, we take that for granted now. Not that long ago, you'd have had to um, go and find an actual translator to sit down and go through it all. And obviously, it's not perfect translation, but it allows people, it allows readers if they want to, to go and read a vast array of different news websites from around the world in different languages and get that information um, in front of them, which I think is a fantastic thing. And I actually think we are seeing the public and voters actually get more educated as they're getting different perspectives from around, um, you know, around the world. We've just got to make sure it doesn't become too much of an echo chamber. That's the great challenge, of course. Yeah. Let's just take um, that gentleman there and then the lady in the pink also had a hand up. Do you still want a question or do you want to pass it? We'll, we'll, we'll do one and two if, if that okay. gentleman asks and then, and then you ask. And then we'll come back to the Brexit question that was at the back there as well. And, and your bias being good. I'm a, I'm a Palestinian journalist and uh, an avid watcher of CNN, both international and domestic. And uh, you don't follow the simple rule of people are the best experts on their own lives. On issues of Arab, Israeli issues, you, don't, you rarely see Arabs. You see a lot of foreigners talking about what Arabs think, but you don't have Arabs actually talking about themselves. On issues of anti-Semitism, you don't hear anybody on the other side. It's always people telling us what, and what they think is anti-Semitic, but you don't hear what the other side or the victims or the people who are being accused. So I think you need to do some more work on, on balance. In fact, I noticed that in the Intifada a few years ago, you had many of us on television much more than you do now. I don't know what's happening with CNN, but uh, I mean, 
Christiana Amanpour might have a Palestinian, but always there is an Israeli next to him. There is never just a Palestinian by themselves. So just an observation. Thank you. Can you pass? Just thank you. Um, so I thought I'd just add something which I think is good news. Um, I teach journalism at uh, Birmingham City University, but I'm also with the Broadcast Journalism Training Council. And the Broadcast Journalism Training Council is the biggest um, accreditor of journalism courses in the UK. Um, the first of the free download e-books that we uh, put together, uh, which is called Everybody In, it's around inclusion and diversity, aimed at journalism students, written by current journalists, short and punchy. The first bit of it is unconscious bias with a test in there. So I, I think what's very positive is actually we are talking about it. It's actually very much part of a lot of training now. So I suspect that there will be, and I would really love to see and hear it in future journalism festivals, some of that coming through uh, in the trainees that you see. Thank you. Um, I'm aware of time, um, despite having left 20 minutes for questions. We always run out of time for questions. Um, but I'm aware that we haven't actually answered the lady at the back's questions. And I want to get to those. And then there's one more here. If it's a, is it a question or an observation? Question? Question, great. Can you, and let's get the questions from those two and then we'll do a quick fire round, one each. Then that'll give us four and we can get, take one each and then we'll, we'll let you get to the evening. Hi, I'm Tony from the UK. Um, so recently there was the attack in Christchurch and the way that that was um, portrayed on a certain tabloid newspaper was quite, well, the attacker was described as an, ang as an angelic boy who grew into a far-right killer. Um, when an attacker killed 50 people in Orlando, he was described as an ISIS maniac. Could um, bias checking have stopped that? Um, could a more diverse newsroom have stopped that? Is there a place for regulation to stop that kind of thing happening in the future? Thank you. And then your next door neighbour, and then we'll take one, one each. Um, Stefan from Germany. Uh, both of you seem to agree that uh, it's not good for an editor to tweet his opinion because of objectivity and bias reasons. But not to tweet an opinion does not mean to not have an opinion. So mm -hmm. wouldn't it be more transparent to tweet yeah. the opinions and to be a normal person? Not a guest writers. <laughs> okay, so we've got four questions lined up, one each. If you can take it. Um, has the BBC been too neutral on Brexit? I guess you're going to take that one, Michael. I mean, um, the only thing is, on which side said that? Was it the Remain side or the Leave side? I'm not sure. Which side of the argument said that? Was it a pro Brexit or anti Brexit rally? I can't remember. It was. Uh, <laughs> There was also a criticism a, a little while ago. I think there was a tweet that kind of went viral. If somebody says it's raining, someone says it's not raining, your job isn't to report both. Your job is to look out the window. It was a bit ruder than that. And check. So I, I, I think it probably relates to, to one of those criticisms as well. Yeah. Can I just answer the, the gentleman at the end? Uh, yeah, OK, so you're going to take the gentleman at the end. Yeah. We're, we're just, we're just going to divvy them out, because then we'll go faster. So you're going to take the gentleman at the end. Um, uh, Ziz, do you want to take this bias ever good? Um, you want to take I, was one? Actually, Christchurch? I wanted to take Christchurch. Okay, you take Christchurch. I'll take this bias over good. <clears throat> You're going to take um, the gentleman who was talking about CNN. Sure. Yeah? Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, is bias ever good? Uh, I, I think, I, I just keep coming back to the fact that if, if we're going to have, if we're going to be honest about our biases, let's be transparent about them. You know, so, so Reuters will continue to try to be as unbiased as possible and we will use all of the editing systems and the protocols that we have in place to do so. But actually, I really like the fact that I can go around the internet these days and know that I'm getting something that is biased towards a female voice or towards a, um, a, a non-British voice. You know, as, as you were saying, Michael, like the fact I can read an Italian newspaper or a German newspaper on the same topic, I think, is a great thing. And I, I actually feel that, that right now, the, the ability to get a plurality of voices into your diet, it goes back to our very first question, like how do we help users have a plurality um, of, of, of perspectives? And there are so many great apps now which will give you kind of that full coverage view and will give you a view from lots of different perspectives. And to me, that's, that's really rich. And so I would prefer that people were honest and transparent about their biases so that then I could learn better about what it's like to read the news of somebody who's not me. 
because I, I read it with my background, and I'd like to understand stories from a different background. So I think, yes, I think bias can be really good, but let's be transparent about it and, and, and help people understand where we're coming from. You. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing your perspective. I think that uh, it's always important to hear the feedback, to, to take it in. So I appreciate you standing up and sharing that. I will say I'm quite proud of CNN's international reporting and the wide variety of voices we represent, uh, both on our air and on our sites. Uh, our journalists go into uh, war zones and very, very dangerous settings all over the world at huge risk to themselves. And I deeply admire that. Uh, my colleague, Blinded Healy, is in the audience who helps run our international digital coverage. And she's uh, a really brilliant at bringing different perspectives and voices into our coverage and has really uh, increased the, uh, the strength of our work we're doing internationally with, with different voices. So, uh, so I would encourage you to, to take a look at some of that. I, I think that it's important in our work, as I've said, to check ourselves against bias, to bring many different voices into the mix. At the end of the day, too, I think that we, we can't be timid in our journalism. We have to be confident in what we're saying. We can't default to journalism that uh, is afraid to call out what we need to call out if there's something we're writing about that is simply wrong or untrue. We can't be so afraid of hearing negative feedback of bias that we don't bring that context to the forefront as well. Well, no, I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you, sir. I mean, the, the whole idea that editors and prominent news people, um, outside of some exceptions, because there will be some exceptions, can be completely neutral and these sort of robot type things is a very old style of thinking, I think, that is now being exposed by social media. Because at the end of the day, if someone is giving their opinion repeatedly on a subject very strongly, as many broadcasters in the UK now do, and then goes on TV and says, trust me, I'm, I'm straight down the middle, I'm giving you both sides of the argument. I don't think that's a credible proposition. And I think the problem that we've got is with the regulations in the UK, which is that with Ofcom, everything has to be done with due impartiality. So we aren't allowed a conservative news channel. We're not allowed uh, direct editorial control over news. And I think what it does is insult the audience, because people are now looking at what journalists are saying and what they privately believe. And for them to then turn around and say, well, no, I don't have any opinions when I'm, when I'm on TV, but as soon as I come off, I have loads, I don't think is a very sustainable way forward. And I think if they carry on going down that road, they're going to have less and less people, or fewer and fewer people listen to them. OK, and Christchurch. <clears throat> I, think, um, I think that's a very astute observation. And the way the media reports on both victims and perpetrators of violence, be it um, terrorist attacks or rapists or serial murderers, has to be a very delicate process. And what's working against the media now is that, especially in the smaller outfits, we have fewer people. And the competition, because of the low barrier of entry, because now it does not cost a lot of money to set up a media outlet and start broadcasting your opinions. That means that the competition is growing. So there is this sense of urgency that we have to compete, for example, by being first. By being first and by telling stories that other people don't have yet. <clears throat> and this kind of environment does not lend itself to careful wording and to bias checking. If, if we have created a sense of urgency around being first in order to get readers, then we don't exactly have time to consult other people around us. Even if we have a diverse team, if we're rushing, then we don't have time to ask people for opinions, which, by the way, is an excellent way to check your biases. There's one caveat to that, however. You can't consult people who like you. <laughs> you have to consult the people who are less impressed by you, and they're the ones who will show you where your bias lies. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for being with us. Um, we could keep this conversation going on, I'm sure, for several hours. Um, I invite you to continue the conversation uh, with us, with each other, and uh, we'll take up the opportunity to bring it back next year, as you were saying, with, um, with some more of the students and, and people who are checking their unconscious bias and see where we've got to. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.